Hello, hello! Welcome back to the final installment of Three Little Words, a memoir by Ashley Rhodes Corder. Um, and if you're new, welcome here, but stop right there and go catch up um, with the videos that have already been posted, unless you're just at the end of the book and wanted some someone to read it to you. In that case, stick around. Um, give me your thumb if you've liked this book, um, and subscribe for my next summer read, which I believe is going to be Sarah's Key, um, by, I think the author is Tatiana de Rosne. If I'm wrong, apologies. There is no time to waste, because I leave, um, in an hour and a half, and I really want to get this recorded and uploaded for you guys. So, this is going to be the last chapter, as well as some pictures from Ashley's childhood, the epilogue, and, um, the essay that she wrote for an essay contest. So it's going to be kind of a, an amalgamation of different things, but without any further ado, we are on page 290 with chapter 13. Sunshine Found. I journeyed alone for almost 10 years before I found home. Adoptions are like very delicate gardening with transplants and grafts. Some are rejected immediately. Mine took hold, rooted, and bloomed, even though there were inevitable adjustments to the new soil and climate. Yet I have not forgotten where my roots started. I still do not know who my biological father is. Recently, I came across the name and address of the most likely, likely candidate. In a moment of courage, I telephoned him and left a message. He returned my call while I was out and told Gay that he very well might be my birth father. He offered to undergo DNA testing if I wished. I was too nervous to try again, although I later sent him my high school graduation picture. When he received it, he was so struck with my resemblance to members of his family that he called again. We had a long talk, but we have not confirmed paternity. My mother also dated his brother, which complicates the situation. A few years after meeting my mother for lunch, I attended a drama camp at Duke University. Gay and Phil came to see my final performance. On the way home, we visited my Uncle Sammy and his wife, Aunt Courtney. Their children's chocolate eyes, red hair, and freckled faces mirrored mine. Yep, you're a Rhodes, all right, my uncle said. Aunt Leanne stopped by, and we fell into each other's arms. I felt more warmth toward her than I had to my mother the last time I saw her. Side by side, we went through some of the family albums. As I turned a page, an envelope fell out. Aunt Leanne reached for it, but the picture of a tiny baby in a box had already slipped into view. Do you remember Tommy? she asked. I felt as if my spine had turned to ice. The baby in the box. The secret I wasn't supposed to tell. He was born when you were almost two, Aunt Leanne whispered. He lived for only 48 days. The gray doll-like baby transfixed me. Why did he die? Sids, Aunt Courtney said. He was premature and his lungs hadn't developed well, so that's probably why. I think that's like sudden infant death syndrome or something like that. It was a horrible time. Uncle Sammy sighed and left the room. Then I heard him on the phone. Guess who's sitting in our kitchen? Ashley. When he came back in the room, Uncle Sammy announced, your grandpa is coming over. We don't see him much, but he always asks about you. Where's Adele? I asked. She's been quite ill, Sammy said, that they had not uh, been in contact for many years. When my grandfather arrived, he did not have much to say, although I could tell he was pleased to see me again. Uncle Sammy asked if I wanted to revisit some of the places where I had lived. Uncle Courtney, Gay, Phil, and my cousins piled into Phil's van. We drove past the house where Dusty had grown up, the trailer Dusty and my mother had rented, and the apartment where Tommy died. Do you remember any of this? Phil asked. No, nothing, I said. I was still numb from the startling news that I had had another brother. Something I remembered as a kid, but somehow had forgotten. We parked alongside a small country cemetery and marched over clumps of ruddy earth to the Grover graveyard. Your brother was named Tommy Grover after him. Uncle Sammy pointed to the tombstone for Dusty's father, Thomas. He was only 30? Gay asked after doing the math. His own father shot him, supposedly over a card game. Uncle Sammy replied, those Grovers were always trouble. Was there a family feud or something? I asked. You might say that. Luke's grandma didn't want us Rhodeses to get you, because the Lord knows we tried, Aunt Courtney said. Leanne called social services for years, but they wouldn't tell her nothing, Sammy added. Where's Tommy buried? I asked. I thought there was a marker for the baby, Uncle Sammy said. Used to be next to his grandfather, 
Aunt Courtney paced the Grover section, looking down. I felt dizzy in the hot Carolina sun and leaned against Phil for support. He steered me back to our van. Shortly after we returned to my uncle's house, the phone rang. Aunt Courtney handed it to Leanne, who took the portable outside. After she hung up, there was a muffled discussion between Aunt Courtney and Gay. Gay announced that it was time for us to leave, and before I knew what was happening, my reunion was over. What was the deal with the phone call? I asked when we got on the road. Lorraine heard you were going to visit the family, so she started driving up from Florida yesterday, Gay said. They didn't want you around when she arrived. Why? I'm not sure. They said she was about an hour away, and they wanted us gone. Later that evening, Leanne, Aunt Leanne called Gay and told her that my mother's car had broken down and that the police had arrested her. My heart fluttered wildly. What about Autumn? Your uncle is going to get her. Find out if she's okay, I insisted. Don't let them put her in foster care. Gay stayed in touch with Aunt Courtney and Uncle Sammy, who cared for my sister during this crisis. I continued to email Uncle Sammy and had some contact with Aunt Leanne. My mother also emailed me and we had several telephone conversations around that time. When I was in my last year of high school, a letter for me from a federal prison arrived in care of the school. Dusty Grover had read an Associated Press article about me that mentioned the name of my school, which is how he knew where to reach me. He wrote me a long letter and included another for Loop. He said he had been trying to contact us for many years. In his correspondence, Dusty gave a different spin on various episodes. He claimed he was never violent to my mother and loved Luke and me very much. He told one story that I found especially curious. He described how Lorraine and Leanne made plans to go to Florida to visit Luke and me. When he asked whether she was bringing us any presents, she said she did not have the money. So he claimed he bought me an Easy Bake oven and, another, and other things for Luke. So my precious oven, always a symbol of my mother's love for me in my mind, may have been bought by him. I suppose he really did care for me. Currently, Dusty is serving time in a federal prison for bank robbery and will not be released for many years. Although we are not blood relatives, I still think of him as my first father. After a reunion at Uncle Sammy's, my grandfather was sent to jail for selling drugs. His former girlfriend, Del Pickett, passed away after a long illness. Mrs. Moss was arrested again for child neglect. She had violated her probation by caring for another child. She did not receive any additional jail time. My Uncle Sammy and his family have been very kind to me. They have visited us twice and even flew down from my high school graduation, where they became reacquainted with Luke. My mother now has a good job and is divorced from Art. I have been getting to know her and Autumn again. It has been important for me to have caring biological family in my life. Karen Gevers and Mary Miller worked out a favorable settlement in Luke's case. He continued to live at the children's home for five years after I left. The Hudsons and the Merritts remained his friends. Then, at last, a champion came forward for Luke. A former Navy officer was working on his BS degree in special education when he saw Luke's listing on Florida's adoption website. He went through extensive training and jumped through many bureaucratic hoops to become his adoptive parent. parent. However, by then, Luke had been in the system for 14 of his 15 years. During a trip to London, Luke admired the royal horses and asked to have riding lessons. He showed a natural aptitude for jumping and loved competing, but nothing comes easy for my brother. He is now 18 and struggling to overcome all the setbacks he has had over the years. I am still in contact with Mary Miller, my guardian at Lytham, to whom I owe so much and appreciate far more now than I did when I was a child. She still volunteers to represent children in the court system. Martha Cook, the attorney who handled our termination case pro bono, is now a family court judge in Tampa. Coincidentally, she finalized Luke's adoption. Ms. Sanes received her master's degree in social work, became a licensed counselor, and still works at the children's home as the counseling services manager. She married her former likes colleague, Mr. Todd, and they have two adorable sons. Every time I return to the children's home, Mr. Irvin greets me with a broad smile. Those kids are blessed to have a staff member who cares as much as he does. My brother Josh married Saffron. At last, I have a big sister, and I could not have asked for a more loving or beautiful one. Blake and Josh have been supportive and have helped me through the times when a girl needs big brothers. Karen Gevers was hired by most of the Moss's adopted children, including Mandy. 
I learned that Mandy was married and had a baby, but not much else. Before I went to college, I packed the boxes that pertained to my foster care history. When I reviewed the spreadsheet that listed everyone in South Carolina and Florida who had been responsible for my case, I was amazed by how many there were. I counted. 73 child welfare administrators. 44 child welfare caseworkers. 19 foster parents. 23 attorneys. 17 psychologists, psychiatrists, and therapists. Five guardian at Litton staff, four judges, four court personnel, three abuse registry workers, two primary caseworkers, one guardian at Litton. Out of these 195 people, only Mary Miller and Martha Cook were unpaid volunteers, yet they were the two people who made the greatest difference in my life. I completed the first draft of this book on the sixth anniversary of my adoption. Thunder boomed as I returned home after picking up pizzas for a celebration. The sky started to brighten as I unwrapped an elegant wooden box. The top had a decoupage portrait of a 19th century princess twisting a pearl necklace, which Phil had altered by substituting my face. I laughed aloud, then opened the box. It was a music box, and it played You Are My Sun Sunshine. Something very tight and very deep inside me snapped. Tears spurted unexpectedly. I looked across the table directly into the shining eyes of my parents, Gay and Phil, my mother and fa my father, were crying with me. Then we laughed at one another's bawling. The late afternoon light streamed through the mist on the Crystal River, and I felt something I had never known before. Home. And that is the end of chapter 13. That's like the end of the book, I guess. But um, I'm going to read a couple of other things that are at the back here. First is note to the reader from Ashley. Quote first. Home is not where you live, but where they understand you. That's from Christian Morgenstern. This book is a memoir of my journey through a troubled childhood, one where I often felt abandoned, neglected, and trapped in a failing foster care system to my eventual arrival at a secure and loving home. In recreating events described, I relied on my memory as well as extensive research which included review of court records, legal depositions, social service files, other government records, newspaper accounts, and photographs. I also conducted personal interviews and traveled to former foster homes and other places I lived. I have changed names and identifying details, including, in some instances, locations of some persons portrayed, including those in my biological family. My foster families, with the exception of Marjorie and Charles Moss, who have been the subject of prior news coverage, and anybody who was a minor during the time of my story, except for my adoptive brothers and myself, a few characters are composites. I have happily identified by their real names many wonderful people, including some very special teachers who were positive influences. Many of the adults who cared for me did a decent job. A few literally saved my life. But there were some rotten apples who did not only abandon, neglect, or abuse me, but also defiled their legal, moral, and ethical duties. I don't know which is worse. Parents who don't care for their children, biological fathers who don't support their offspring, or professionals who violate their professional standards, as well as the public trust, by neglecting those under their care and control. Because of my civil suits, much of this story, my story, has already been made public. I hope that the other children who lived with me in the Ma's home, particularly the one I call Mandy in this book, will let me know how they are doing. I only wish I could have done more for them. I think that one of the reasons people have been so interested in having me speak and write about my story is because most children's voices are suppressed or ignored. I represent thousands, probably tens of thousands of children who have been lost in the system. We are a chorus of voices that need to be heard. Um, next are the acknowledgments. I'm going to skip those because it's a lot of names, um, a lot of which we've heard in the book. Um, but if you have this copy, you know, definitely give that a, ch uh, a look. But on to page 302. Um, I believe this is a essay that she wrote for a contest. Um, let me read the introduction here. When I was a junior in high school, Gay showed me an announcement for a New York Times Magazine essay contest that asked high school students to describe a moment in their lives in which they learned something about themselves. The experience had to be true. I immediately was reminded of my adoption day videotape. I blurted, I'll write about my adoption day. I paused for a moment, 
then told her why I would title it Three Little Words. Everyone will assume the words are I love you, but what I actually felt and said that day was far from that. Three Little Words I never thought three little words would have such an impact on my life, even though they weren't the words I was supposed to say. Every time I see the videotape, I cringe. It was one of those memorable occasions that families treasure, but this is one treasure I would rather bury. It was July 28th, 1998, my adoption day. I had spent almost 10 of my 12 years in foster care. I was now living in my 14th placement. Some homes had lasted less than a week, few more than a year. So why would this one be any different? Before this placement, I had been in residential care, the politically correct name for an orphanage. Do you remember the movie Cider House Rules when the orphans tried to smile in just the right way so they would be picked by the couple shopping for a child? While it was not supposed to be so obvious at the children's home of Tampa, prospective parents did act as though they were looking at puppies in a pet shop. For more than two and a half years, I watched the few lucky dogs pack up their belongings, wave goodbye, and exit the gate. I also saw them return, even after being placed with a family. With their tails between their legs, people made promises about forever families, but often something went wrong. I don't know what families expected. Nobody is perfect, and children who have been rejected by their parents or at least feel they've been, or hoping that someone will love them no matter how they behave. I had been living with my new family for eight months. Everything seemed to be going well, but would that change after the papers were signed? And just because it was official, did that mean they would not send me back if I didn't live up to their expectations? My parents have two biological kids who are grown, so they thought raising a daughter might fill their empty nest. I loved my new waterfront house with my own room and a bathroom I didn't have to share. For the first time, I could have friends over and my all-star softball team came to swim after our games. Overnights are forbidden in foster care. But now I hosted and went to slumber parties. I could use the phone anytime I wanted, and lots of the calls for were for me. I had my first pet, a kitten named Kachu, that slept on my bed. There were no locks on the refrigerator or scheduled meal times. I could help myself to as many boxes of macaroni and cheese, bowls of ramen noodles, or grilled cheese sandwiches as I wanted. When I did something wrong, my pre-adoptive parents docked my allowance or cut back on TV or telephone time. In one foster home, I was beaten with a paddle, denied food, forced to stand in awkward positions, swallow hot sauce, and run laps in the blistering sun. Other times, I was removed to a new home with a new set of rules and promises. Nobody really lives happily ever after, do they? But when was this picture-perfect story going to fall apart, before or after the finalization? You can see how terrified I am on the videotape as we enter the courthouse. My eyes seem to be searching for a way out as I am led into Judge Florence Foster's chambers. On one side of the conference table are the people from my old life. On the other, those who represent my new one. I am placed between Gay and Phil, who are about to become my new parents. Across the way are two representatives from the children's home, both therapists. They are happy for me, but that is their job. Mary Miller is smiling and holding a bouquet. She had been my guardian at Lytton for four years and did the most to help get me a family. Our side is also represented by Gay's father, Grampy Wiseman, and one of my new brothers, Josh, who is home from college and acting as the cameraman, and my new godparents, the Winers, who have brought their three small daughters. The proceedings are delayed because the Department of Children and Families representative is late. He also held up the adoption by neglecting the paperwork for months. While the others chat, I am biting my lip and biding my time. Finally, the representatives arrive and my attorney, Neil Spector, who is also Gay's cousin, begins the proceedings. I wait for my cue. But what am I supposed to do? Act as if this is the happiest day of my life? How can it be? when I am petrified that everything is a big fat lie. After some legal jargon, the judge turns to me. Nothing in life comes easy, she begins. If it does, you should be suspicious. She may be trying to comfort me by saying she knows I've overcome many hardships to get where I am. Instead, she just reinforces my fears that life with my new family is too good to be true. Because of my age, I have to consent to the adoption. After talking... To my parents, the judge asks me, do you want me to sign the papers and make it official, Ashley? On the tape, it looks as if I am trapped center stage in the spotlight. Do I have a choice? I stare straight ahead. 
shrug my shoulders, and mumble, I guess so. In three words, it is done. P.S. Almost five years later, I'm still with my family. I didn't know then what I know now. Some people can be trusted. That's the end of that essay. After I won first prize and the essay appeared in the newspaper, I received calls from agents, editors, even movie producers wanting me to tell or sell my story. I had dipped into my files that had arrived for the lawsuit, but did not know how the fragments stitched together. My memories were like tangled chains without a beginning or ending. Some were raw feelings, like a tendon cut loose from bone. I knew there was much more I had to find out before I could write my story. And that journey has helped make sense of my convoluted past. My anger toward the mosses and my mother has dissipated. Maybe because I understand each of them better. Most of all, my traveling companions are my real parents. We learned about my childhood together. And in some ways, it was as if I grew up with them by my side. And now we get some pictures from her childhood. Here's one. And here's two. They read, one of my few baby pictures just before my adoption. Gay found it with many other baby pictures buried in my case files. She was on the phone. And this one's Luke and me at ages two and four respectively when we were living at the Heinz foster home. Researching my lost childhood, I revisited the Heinzes and they gave me an album that covered the time Luke and I lived with them. Got a couple more pictures. This one says chicken pox, me and two other children in a bathtub. And this one looks like a birthday party. A birthday party, not mine, in the Ortiz home. I'm third from the right on the couch. Got another one. That one says, I'm playing a house at my grandfather's home in South Carolina. He built us a playhouse outside our trailer. Adele hung a clothesline for me to dry my doll's clothes. So she's hanging up doll's clothes. This is real cute. A friend and I posing in swimsuits on the moss's patio before going to the beach. Right. Here's, it says, I'm in the cramped girls' bedroom at the mosses. A lot of beds. Here's her and Luke. Luke and me outside of his cottage at the children's home. When we moved there, Luke and I had been apart for six months. He would cling to me whenever he saw me, and sometimes the staff would have to drag him away. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta see that again. Look how he's hanging on to her. So sweet. Um, My drawing won the contest and was on the cover of Children in Waiting, a catalog of faces and biographies of children available for adoption. Later, the quarters who saw my photo in this book told me that they had hoped the drawing was mine. So here's her Children in, in Waiting drawing. And here we go. I'm at my first Murphy Awards ceremony at the Children's Home. I participated in many events and won several awards. Members of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers football team presented the trophies that year. Here I am meeting Phil and Gay Quarter for the first time in September 1997. They were much older than the parents I had hoped for, but they were the only ones who had ever wanted me. I was relieved to have Miss Sanis at my side. Grampy Wiseman, Phil, me, Judge Florence Foster, and Gay pose after my adoption on July 28th, 1998. I just uttered my fateful three little words. I felt the adoption was all a sham, and though the quarters would and thought the quarters would unadopt me at any moment. So there's Grampy, Phil, Ashley, the judge, and Gay. Here I am with my guardian at Litum, Mary Miller. She is the volunteer who rescued me from foster care and helped me get adopted. Thinking she was just another in a long line of workers, I did not appreciate all that she was doing for me at the time. Mary's the one holding the bouquet. Here I am with J.K. Rowling at the breakfast for the Harry Potter essay contest winner in New York. J.K. Rowling told me how proud she was that I had overcome so much already and predicted I would go far. I've taken her encouraging words to heart. And the last two. Here I'm meeting President Clinton in December 2000. After Hillary Rodham Clinton mentioned my Harry Potter essay on television, I wrote to her. 
In response, she invited, she invited me to an amazing Christmas party at the White House. And the last one, me, Josh, his wife, Saffron, Blake, and my adoptive parents, Phil and Gay Quarter, on our deck overlooking Crystal River, Florida. New Year's morning, 2006. Every year we take a family photo. Some funny, some serious. It's difficult getting everyone to agree on a theme or place, but I treasure everyone. That's their family photo. And last but not least, the epilogue. On parents weekend, my freshman year in college, I sat across from Phil and Gay in the campus pub. All around me were other students and their families. I must have had a strange look on my face because Gay asked, is something wrong? I never thought I'd ever be at a college like this and I never thought I would be just like everyone else with parents. Phil looked around at some of the sullen faces on the other students. I think you're the only kid here who is actually glad to have parents hanging around. I was more than glad to have them there. At the end of high school, I had finished one version of Three Little Words and had no idea what was going to happen to the book or my life. I had won a full-ride merit scholarship to Eckerd College, and my first few weeks there were stormy, literally. We were evacuated three times as hurricanes crisscrossed Florida and threatened our waterfront campus. Since I was only two hours from home, I often made excuses to bring friends for visits and sometimes made the drive back to the quarters just to do my laundry and enjoy one of Gay's home-cooked meals enjoy it. <laughs> but after my first semester, it became harder to find time to come home, except for the holidays. My freshman year, I was taking an honors course load, like was playing rugby, and had the part of Celia in As You Like It. Eckerd encourages international study, so my sophomore year, I signed up for a service learning trip to South Africa, and the following year, a Shakespearean course in England. My major expanded from communications to include theater, and I added minors in political science and psychology. When possible, I accepted speaking engagements across the country. Today, Gay, Phil, Blake, and Josh get together several times a year, and now I look forward to and cherish all the holidays and trips with the Quarter family. Since I travel so often, I've been able to catch up with my adoptive brothers and their respective cities on my own. Sadly, Saffron and Josh have gone their separate ways, but have remained friends. Luke has continued to have his ups and downs. On his 20th birthday, we did get to enjoy each other's company while I took him shopping for his gifts. I applaud every time he makes a good decision for himself and hope that it lasts. When I was in college, Phil and Gay started com complaining about their empty nest, but their solution this time was a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel puppy, whose Blenheim coloring happens to match my hair. They continue to make films about children's welfare and other important issues. Gay is still a guardian at Lytton, and Phil is on the board for our local so social service agency. When my wonderful guardian at Lytton, Mary Miller, moved out of state, she asked if I would fly with her so she could bring both of her cats on the plane. I remembered how awestruck I had been when I first met her, and now I was proud to be able to help her for a change. I've stayed in touch with others from the children's home, especially Miss Sandness and her husband, Mr. Todd, both of whom came to my college graduation party. Just before I started my junior year of college, I idly searched the web for contests to enter. I shot off six entries and essays. A few months later, I won three of them. I was selected as one of 20 members of USA Today's All Academic First Team and one of Glamour Magazine's Top 10 College Women and one of the four Do Something Golden Brick with the exclamation point as the I, win, uh, award winners, excuse me, which gave $25,000 to an adoption organization. At the televised award ceremony, I was allowed to have a support person on stage with me, and I picked my brilliant editor at Simon & Schuster, Kylie Fitzsimmons. I have kept in contact with Lorraine, my biological mother, and my sister Autumn. Last year, I took Autumn trick-or-treating, and both of them attended my college graduation, sitting with Gay and Phil. My speech mentor, Lou, he Lou Heckler, and his wife, John Ellen, after we all enjoyed a graduation lunch together. Eventually, all the other children I lived with in the Moss home got their own lawsuits and were all settled in their favor. As it turns out, the abuse had actually worsened after I left, and my case was not as extraordinary. My attorney, Karen Evers, continues to represent children who have been 
egregiously abused in the foster care system. Four years passed between my beginning this book and its publication. But the timing worked perfectly because when it came out, I graduated college and could devote time to a busy schedule of interviews and speeches. My dream of becoming a motivational speaker to promote better foster care and more adoptions of older children has been realized. Traveling all the time has its tribulations. Nevertheless, I love the people I meet, especially the child advocates, the adoptive and foster parents, and the waiting children. I try to offer young people hope that they can get out of the system and that even if they are not adopted, they should not put limits on themselves, but use every opportunity that comes their way. In this spirit, Simon & Schuster offered two college scholarships for foster children. One day, I hope to have a family of my own and am excited about the prospect of being a mother. But in the meantime, I keep myself busy with two cats, a dog, and fish. And even as a young adult, I can't help but be a contest junkie. My most recent entry was for an airline that each year searches for the most intrepid road warriors. And that is the end. We made it. Three Little Words by Ashley Rhodes Corder. Um, I really enjoyed this one. I hope you did too. And let me know how you liked it in the comments. And I'll see you next time with my next book. All right. Hope you're doing well and bye.